One of the most successful entrepreneurs in America over the past 50 years is going public with his fourth and final prediction about a scenario he calls America's nightmare winter. You've probably never heard of Bill Bonner, but in addition to owning an interest in businesses all over the globe, he also owns more than 100,000 acres with massive properties in South America, Central America, the US, plus three large properties in Europe. Bonner says, we're about to enter a very strange period in America, which could result in the most difficult times we've seen in many, many years. Bonner has made three similar predictions in his 50 plus year career, and each one proved to be exactly right. Although he was mocked each and every time. That is why I strongly encourage you to read about Bonner's fourth and final prediction, totally free today. It's all spelled out in a free report we've put together about America's nightmare winter scenario. Get the facts for yourself. Go to AmericanWarning2022.com to get your free copy of this report. Even if he's only partially right, it will dramatically affect you and your money. So again, www.americanwarning2022.com. Welcome to Making Money. This is Matt McCall. Thanks for joining me. It's Thursday, the 15th of December, 2022. One of my favorite people here at work is about to sit down and join me. He's the master of numbers, the master of charts. He can break down anything. We're going to take a look at a situation that's happening in the market right now from four or five different angles, and they all are pointing in the same direction for a big rally in stocks in the next two years. Scott Garlis is joining me right now on Making Money. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Matt. Of course. So before we kind of look ahead, Scott, let's kind of look back at 2022. I mean, I hate to look back because you can't drive a car looking in the rearview mirror, right? But we have to learn from history. <laughs> yes. So, do you want to tell me what the hell happened in 2022? Because my head is still spinning. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so what we saw was the Fed and Congress uh, tried to rescue the economy back in 2021. Uh, well, really 2020 is when they started. And then what happened in March 2021 was we took a step too far. We went one stimulus check too many. And so what happened was we all of a sudden had all these people with all this extra money they'd never had before and they spent it, mm -hmm. which is what we wanted because yeah. <laughs> we wanted the economy to do well, yeah. uh, but the economy did too well. And so in 2021, we grew at 5.7%, I think what the final GDP number was. And now that compares to the 2.3% GDP average in the decade between uh, the financial crisis and the COVID pandemic. Mm -hmm. So we did over 2X, like two and, a, right. two and a half times what we normally do. You cannot have that sort of excess growth without paying for it on the other side. And so basically what 2022 is, we're paying for it right now. Um, and so we had hyperinflation because of that growth and the Federal Reserve, you know, stayed too loose for too long and now they're they're playing catch up. Is it, you know, I'm putting together my, my kind of 2023 outlook right now and I'm trying to think of a word and I came up with like a bit of a term this weekend. It's almost like a market reset, isn't it? Like you said, yes. we, we, were at, we were at a level that was just unsustainable and we had to reset. And when I say reset, I'm like, all asset classes, basically. Yeah, yeah, I just, I, it's really a dose of reality for yeah. everybody. It's, I would love to say we could gain 100% every year yeah. investing, <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah. that would be awesome. And, and I'm sure, you know what, if you, you worked hard enough and scratched hard enough and got really lucky, you could probably find that one market every sure. year, but uh, it, it's gonna be hard. Uh, but yeah, just look, you can't have huge outside outsized gains without playing a little catch up. And I just, I think that's what it is. Now, I think longer term, I, I think this is great mm -hmm. because to me, I'm like, man, this, this means I'm gonna get an opportunity to invest some more money and make some decent returns going forward. So that being said, have you lived through something similar to this or is this a bit of an anomaly that this past year of what we've seen? You know, uh, it reminds me a lot of the financial crisis but I don't think we're gonna see the financial crisis fallout like what we did then. I think the problem with the, the system then was there was, was way over levered. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I'm not saying that there isn't some leverage uh, in the system now that still needs to be flushed out, but I, I think it was, was very different. I think some of the controls were put in place with like capital buffers at banks. 
um, things the Fed did, and and we sort of we learned from some of that. And I think part of the reason, besides what the Fed did, staying too loose for too long, mm-hmm. right now they're they're maybe over tightening. They're going to stay tighter for a bit longer because. Mm-hmm they don't want to screw up on the other side of it. and Is that, that because they already screwed up on the one side, so they don't want to screw up on the other side? Basically. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, it's funny. I, so I recently talked to a guy who worked at the Federal Reserve and was was part of that uh, first quantitative easing process, and he helped design that, implement it, do all these things. Um, but one of the things he said to me was, you know, the Fed is looking at this, and, and Jerome Powell in particular, he's looking at this. This is his legacy. Yeah. You know, part of part of what he's worried about is, hey, is my legacy saying inflation's transitory and it wasn't? And now yeah. he's worried about, you know, I don't want to be uh, too loose for too long. So yeah. he's going the other way. Um, so he said, right now, what you what you got to think about is the Fed wants to be very cautious, and they're looking at the 70s because when they cut back in the 70s, they cut too soon. And inflation took off yep. again. Um, but what I think we are seeing is Powell may actually have been right that a bunch of this in- inflation problem, a lot of it could have been transitory. Yeah. It just didn't come back as quickly as he was hoping. And, and so now that's all these things are starting to play out. Yeah, I guess it, it's how you would define transitory, right? Some people yeah. might think it's a couple months. He might be right in the fact it was 12 to 16 months or so if you consider that transitory, yeah. that it wasn't there that long. Because... You and I were talking off air earlier uh, about inflation, and you know I, I think we we do see a two handle at some point next year in inflation. And you mentioned possibly even lower at, at the second half of next year. Yeah, I mean we're going up against some really difficult. So I think it was uh, it was October when the comps really started to become more difficult. Um, and so from here until I want to say it's like June, the comps just keep getting more and more difficult. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I mean to put up. You know, 9%, 11% inflation on top of 11% inflation, that's really hard. Yeah. And so if you look at inflation as an annualized number and you don't look at it on a monthly basis, yeah, I think it's going to seriously slow. I mean, you know, the housing market, which is the biggest component, the excess supply and uh, like rental inventories mm-hmm. in particular, it's a couple of things that will really start weighing on owner equivalent rent, which mm-hmm. is basically what you would pay to rent your own house. That really doesn't start to take effect until early next year, yeah. and we'll start to see that slide. But the forward indicator is already showing those prices are dropping, and there's a lot of supply coming out because of the people that started building during COVID. So I even think there's potential for a setup where you could see some of these inflation numbers turn negative in the back half next year. I mean, that would be just a complete, oh, my God moment if that were to happen. I mean, I, I just find it... I think it's going to happen. I agree with you. I think the odds are good, above 50%. But sitting here today, and you know, our colleagues and stuff around us, and everybody's concerned about inflation, our friends and family over the holidays talking about this, yeah. if you told them, people that maybe aren't as into the market, hey, listen, we could potentially have negative inflation next year, they'd probably think you've had way too much eggnog. <laughs> I mean, that's just crazy, right? Like, yes. it's, it's, it sounds even crazy for me to say it out loud. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, yeah it's, it's just, yeah, it's... Uh, yeah, I feel the same way, like, but I just keep looking at all these metrics and, and uh, I, one of our, our co-workers the other day was sending me this chart on goods inflation and it's already dropped from like 8.5% to 2%. And, and one of the things you're saying that I think is really important for people to understand is so there, there's sort of there's market time and then there's real time. Mm-hmm. And in stock market times, like three months, that's an eternity. Yeah. And, and it can feel like that, especially like... So, you know, the first 22 years of my career, I dealt with institutional investors and hedge funds in particular were the, were the bulk of my clients. I just seemed to be better at dealing with them. And I got to know how they act, think. And yet for these guys, three months is, I mean, that's a sure. really long time. But for people like, you know, uh, I want to, uh, gosh, Alan Greenspan, that's how well, I'm dating myself. Yeah. But, uh, for, <laughs> but Jerome Powell, for guys like that, um, you know, for Alan Greenspan too, when he was Fed chairman, like, a year to a year and a half isn't that long. And it, so when they say, hey, it's transitory, you're, yeah. you're right. They're, they're talking about that 12 to 18 month time horizon. But when you're getting impatient, you're like, well, my house price is going down. These yeah. other things, it's, that's a long way away. But you want the Fed to have that longer term time horizon. Yes. You don't want the Fed looking out three months. I understand the hedge funds have to. Yep. That's, that's what they're getting paid to do. But we want the Fed to look further out. And Powell may come out of this looking okay. 
I mean, he, he may. I mean, he's going to have a blemish on it, you know, for yeah. waiting a little too long. But he may come out okay and not come out, you know, basically beating him down, saying he completely destroyed the economy, raising interest rates as the economy is slowing. And, you know, but I think he may come out on the other end okay, honestly, I, I think. So, you know, it, it's funny. Um, I spent some time talking to this uh, Harvard-trained economist for a long time. He was on the National Economics Council. Uh, he was on the Fed board at one time. And he was, he was telling me this, this funny parable at one point that uh, there was, it was years ago in like the 60s and there was a senator talking to the head of the Federal Reserve at that time and he talked about uh, you're doing this, that and the other thing wrong and the, the Fed chair basically said, well, why don't you guys take over the Fed and you can take care of the problem? And he's like, well, then I wouldn't have anybody to blame. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I yeah. mean, I think, you know, <laughs> God bless, uh, you know, that's got to be a tough job, but, yeah. you know, at the end of the day, everybody's going to second guess you no matter what. You're, exactly, you're exactly right. Yeah. So, why don't we jump ahead to 2023? Sure. And I know you have a lot of great stats that you send out to the team all the time. Um, what do you see in 2023? Yeah, so, I, I wouldn't be surprised if we start off the beginning of the year, you know, uh, with, with an uneven market. And when I say uneven, I mean, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if we have a bit of a pullback mm-hmm. again. Uh, people are nervous. You know, a lot of Wall Street is anticipating the market's going to drop in the first half of 23. Um, you know, a lot of those guys are probably anticipating a continued rally in the first half of 2022. Sure, sure. Um, but you know, some of the some of the guys, I think Mike Wilson over at uh, Morgan Stanley, he has been very prescient this past year. Uh, he's saying we could potential for another 20 percent pullback in the first quarter, first half. Um, well, not to cut you off, Scott, but, but sure. what, what drives that 20% from here? You know, we're already, yep. already down, what, 18% or so in the S&P. Yep. We were down more. What, what would drive that? So he's worried, and, and the people that are negative on the market right now, they're worried about margin compression at companies. Um, and so what that's going to do is that's the bear cases, that's going to set have a reset in co- corporate earnings, in, in particular S&P 500 earnings. Yeah. So they look at interest rates. Interest rates have gone from basically zero percent, and you know they're going to go. They're four and a half percent, and the Fed's saying, "Well, we want to get to four and three quarters to five and a quarter before we're done." So guys look at that and they look at that historically, and the way they think about that is like, "Well, if you're borrowing money at five percent, it's a lot different than if you're borrowing at near zero percent." Mm-hmm. So you're going to put a different multiple at five percent than you are at zero percent, and if if we were trading at 20 times back then, what's to say we aren't trading at 14 to 15 times here? Yeah, that's fair. Yep. Um, but you know, we have also seen in the meantime, hedge funds have dialed their leverage way back. Now, a lot of the guys I used to deal with would lever their books up at three to five times, which means if you were trading, let's say 100 million dollars, that means you're trading at like it's three to 500 million dollars. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then you have the long side, short side, it gets even more complicated. Yep. So. Leverage right now is running about one and a half times a little less. That's a very different story. Now, to me, I look at that and say, those guys don't have market exposure, which means they need to dial it back up. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, so the Mike Wilsons of the world that are cautious right now, they're worried that companies, demand's gonna dry up, companies aren't gonna make as much margin, so, and the multiple's gonna drop. So they're saying the S&P 500 needs to go lower. Now. I personally don't think everything's as dire as that. Um, you know, we do have 3.7% unemployment, which is a really low number, mm-hmm. but I don't know that we're going back to sort of a traditional 5.5%. Do I think the economy's slowing? Yes. Do I think it's gonna implode? No. Mm-hmm. I think we're gonna, we're gonna wind up getting through this better than people feel. The other thing I look at is producer price index inflation versus consumer price index inflation. Producer price index inflation is plummeting right now. Mm -hmm. CPI isn't coming off as fast. So what that tells me is even if prices are dropping from companies uh, because the raw material costs are coming down, they're still making decent margin. So, you know, that's important. And that shows up in the earnings because margins was really the earnings numbers. So, you know, maybe they're doing a little less revenue, but if they're still making decent margin, things might not be as bad as some of these strategists are, are calling for in terms of the, an earnings recession. Yeah, also, doesn't it become a little more stock specific? I, I hate the word, I hate the term stock picker's market. I don't like yeah. that, you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's overused, but doesn't are. it kind of come down to that, especially just thinking like retail. Some of these retailers, are, people aren't gonna stop, consumers are not gonna stop spending, but some retailers will come out that, you know, had nice inventory through all this and made it through and kept good margins. Yep. Other retailers, 
had too much inventory and they get they get crushed and they have to start selling stuff at, at a loss. So it, it's kind of going to be company specific next year, don't you think, when things turn around? I, I, I do. And it's, it's going to depend on how honest people were. Um, like one of the names, you know, I think is really interesting to me here is NVIDIA, which has gotten beaten up. But NVIDIA last quarter came out and said, they, they kind of threw it all out there, like how bad things could be with everything going on in China and the U.S. cutting back on what kind of semiconductor inventory, yeah. uh, <clears throat> semiconductors can be sold to China. Now, but re- what's really interesting to me and, and what I love about you know, Americans and American companies, and it doesn't mean I don't love people from Europe, Asia, wherever, but mm. um, just you know, being from here and growing up and learning all these things is Americans have always been great because of their ingenuity and they learn how to adapt and work around problems and evolve. Um, you know, I mean, geez, look at what the world did with COVID. Yeah. It's in, in where we've come in the last couple of years. So NVIDIA has figured out a solution to their problem. They're, they figured out how to manufacture a lower density graphic card that they can sell to the yeah. Chinese. And they already cut their numbers way back for making no sales at all. So I think you're gonna see those types of events happen more. So especially for companies who have reset expectations to where it's a really low bar, they're gonna have an easy hurdle to get over. And when you have an easier hurdle to get over, that means you're gonna outperform. Yep. So yeah, I think it will be company specific, yeah. but I think the Walmarts and the Targets of the world that have said, we have a big inventory problem, yeah. and they, they took markdowns for that, those are the guys that are gonna outperform on the other side of this. Yeah, why, but why not put it out there now? I mean, because you're people are gonna find that eventually. It's like, yes. it's like just you know, pull the bandaid off, get out there and, and move on. So you have some great numbers. Let's go through some of these numbers you have. Yeah, so um, a, a couple of things we've been looking at. Uh, one of the things like Goldman Sachs is recently talking about the uh, equity mutual fund outflows this year. I think it's year to date, they said the number's about $256 billion. Uh, on a typical year, I wanna say it, the inflows average about 200 to 250 billion. And so you and I were talking about this before. I mean, that's like a half a trillion dollars <laughs> below where it normally is. Um, those situations don't last forever, but it, you know, that's, that's a noteworthy thing. And yep. I, I look at that and I'm, I think about those things in terms of, you know, what does that mean for stock market returns? Typically in the past, this has happened three times in like the last 20 ish years is 2008 financial crisis, 2018 around the trade war in 2020 uh, around the COVID pandemic. 12 months later, your average returns 27.5% in the S&P 500. Um, and then 24 months later, like 34.5%. Wow. So, you know, back to what we talked about earlier, mm-hmm. if you, you, as an individual investor in particular, you really need to be long-term oriented in your mm-hmm. investing. And if you have that kind of scope and horizon, you know, events like this and what's going on right now, creates a really great buying opportunity. And I, and I think, I agree, it's, it's a great buying opportunity and, I, and I've been putting my own money into the market little by little because I don't know where the bottom is. I, I agree with you, we could have yep. another drawdown early next year. I'm trying to find a sweet spot long term because this next six months, in my opinion, the last two months included, we're bottomed in October, won't look like much on a five to 10 year chart. I mean, at this little bit. So it's, you'd be yeah. very happy getting in down there most likely. And it's not just buying a thing, Scott, it's also people are getting to the point near the end of the year saying, Maybe I should sell everything and get out. Yes, you know, and that's 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 tough because even though we both agree we could see lower prices in the yep. near term, you need to know when to get back in, yep. and that's so tough. so tough to do for the individual, I think. It, it is, and people that you know, besides doing your own homework, you know, those are always good opportunities. Just as a, as a as regular staple thing to do, say with like cutting money out of your paycheck every month, and just yeah. keep chipping away a little bit of the market, and that way. You can ride the ups and downs, but it just steady. So you buy some of the lows, maybe you buy some of the highs, yeah. but it steadies out over time. And then you do that. And then on top of that, you're doing your own homework, making your own investment ideas because of all the other things you're reading, learning. And then it, all of a sudden, you know, five, 10 years down the road, you're like, wow, this has made a huge difference in my life. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. Yep. All right. What else you got? So, uh, you know, another one of the big things we're talking about the Fed yep. and what's going on with the Fed. So the Fed you know, being, you know, they're targeting four and three quarters to five and a quarter percent in terms of peakish interest rates where a lot of the Fed governors, policymakers are, are guiding for right now. That means we're getting very close to being at the end of the Fed's rate hike cycle, or at least a pause. Uh, so we went back and looked at returns over time when the Fed stops raising interest rates. Uh, and what we found, we went, uh, geez, we went back to the last time uh, inflation was this high, so we went back to the early 80s. And what we found was, 
in all those instances, uh, 12 months later, your average return was 16% in the S&P 500, and that happened about 72% of the time. And then what we also found was 24 months later, you had an average 35.5% gain if you would invest in the S&P 500, and that happened 86% of the time. Wow. So, I mean, those are those are really impressive returns in my book. So it sounds like it really took off in that second year too. You know, 16, but then up to 35. Yep. So I feel like it really took off. And maybe that was, again, people just a bit hesitant, slowly getting into the market, right? Yep. They didn't jump in that V-shape. It was more, you know, more prolonged. But, you know, when you put, when you share numbers like this with me, it's like, we're not cherry picking here. No. This, these are situations that we're in right now. Yes. We look back decades and this is what's happened. Yes. And, yeah. it's what, and that's what amazes me. Some people will argue till they turn blue that these are BS numbers, but this happens to be the exact same situation we're in. I, I'm, I'm not making these Yeah, up. I know, I know. It's like, <laughs> yeah, right, but like, you know, you have some people yes. who pick, you know, pick only good numbers, but we're picking situations that are similar to what we've gone through in yes. the past and putting it here and what the market's done from there. Th that's exactly right. And it's, again, important scope to think about over the lifetime of the stock market, it averages a 9.1% return. So you're talking about in 24 months, you know, the average return is 36%. Versus making nine percent. I mean, that's that's you're forexing it. I mean, and that that doesn't happen all the time. Yeah, <laughs> it's very rarely, no, as a matter no. of fact. Yeah. yeah. So. Well, and then the other, the flip side of that too is we looked at when the Fed starts start, first starts cutting interest rates okay. again. So, you know, I, I personally think uh, with everything the Fed's done, so this is one of the fastest rate hike cycles we've ever seen. It's certainly since the fastest since 1980. Um, you know, what they're going to wind up having to do is probably ease sooner than later, mm -hmm. too. Uh, they're talking about staying staying tight for quite a while. They're guiding sort of for early 24. I wouldn't be surprised if in the back half of 23 we start cutting rates again, um, especially if we start to see inflation really slide like it looks yeah. like it's going to do. So 12 months later, you know, your average gains when they first start cutting rates is 1.1%. So you miss the opportunity if sort of if you don't get in when they stop cutting stop. rates. Okay, that's a great point, wow. So, but 24 months later, your average gains are 27 and a half percent. And that's interesting. Yeah, so it really, back to, it yeah. really accelerates in that second year. Wow. Because it probably, what, what's going on is, there's more borrowing, there's more lending, economic activity is really heating back up in yeah. that second year. Just took a while to get into the market, into yes. the economy of the market, yeah. Yeah, and so it, it really starts to pick up in that second year, and it plays, pretty close with when they stopped cutting, because remember it was that second year was like a 20% gain, yep. but in this case it shows it's about a 26% gain. Right. So th there's another big event that's recently happened. Um, so we keep talking about the, the Fed hiking rates. Well, the other central banks out there waited longer than the Fed did to hike rates. So they're playing catch up. Mm -hmm. So as the Fed starts to slow, the ECB, the Bank of England, they're still trying to play catch up because their currencies have been crushed as ours have gotten stronger. So the market's starting to anticipate a bit of this, and the dollar's starting to crumble. So when the dollar's going up, that's bad for U.S. companies because the simple way to break it down is U.S. made goods cost more overseas when the dollar's stronger. Mm -hmm. But as the dollar weakens, they start to cost less. Um, so that means people can start buying them. Business activity picks up here. When the dollar breaks the 200-day moving average like it just did very recently, that's only happened like twice in the last 20 years. And so it was in 2017 and uh, 2020. And what we found was 12 months later, the S&P 500 averaged a 27.4% gain, and 24 months later, 34.8% gain. So that 34 number is coming up a lot at two years, I, I feel like. It's, it, it is. It's, it will, so that is one of the things that has made me very constructive on a lot of this stuff because I keep looking at these different metrics, yeah. and I keep looking out on the, the long-term horizon, and I keep seeing similar sort of numbers yeah. keep playing out. So I think there are a lot of different factors, coincidental factors mm -hmm. that are all pointing in the exact same direction. There's no guarantee that this will happen, but when I start to see all these different things line up, yeah. that, that makes me think there, there's something to this. The only thing that we can do, you and I as analysts sitting here, is take all the information we have, look at history, look at a situation, and put the odds in our favor, right? This and that's exactly correct. what we're doing right here, looking at this. And and you're coming from different angles and lining this all up and saying, okay, historically when this has happened, you know, if, I, if I'm gambling, I sit down at blackjack, you know, and I get a great hand and my odds are good, you bet more, right? Yes. That's how I feel here. So you put more money in the market in situations like this. Again, we don't know when it bottoms. I'm yep. never going to say that. 
But this is, could be a sweet spot for the next three to five years. I, I would completely agree. And then the last thing, back to the 60-40 yeah. portfolio. Um, so again, the 60-40 portfolio has been killed this year because interest rates have gone up super fast. So when you think about bonds, uh, bonds and interest rates tend to, the price of bonds and interest rates have an inverse relationship. When rates go up, prices drop, and when, when rates go down, prices go up. So when you're raising interest rates at one of the fastest paces on record, bond prices are going to get smoked. So we looked at inflation-adjusted returns for the 60-40 portfolio. Um, right now, we're down about 22.8%. There have been, I believe it's five other times in history since 1928, uh, the, basically the inception of the S&P 500, um, been, been five other times when we've had a worse than 15% return. Um, and again, inflation adjusted being you're taking you know 40% bond return, uh, 60% stock return, and then you're adding that inflation number to it, right? That negative 8.1% uh, has been the average this year. So 12 months later, after you've had those five times, the S&P has been up 15.6% on average, and 24 months later, 36%. <laughs> so you make these numbers up. It's crazy. Yeah, 36.4. Yeah. yeah, but it's like, you know, how many different statistical categories. And you're coming you? at it different ways. That's what I love. It's not just yeah. one, you know, one criteria. You're coming at it different ways. All right, before I let you go, I always ask everybody, and you don't have to answer it, even though everybody's always answered it, but if I sent you, the family, friends, whoever the hell you want to take, maybe me with you as well, to an island for 10 years, whatever yep. island you choose, no phones, nothing, you can buy one investment before you go. It could be an asset class, it could be cash, it could be a stock, it could be an ETF, mutual fund, anything. It could be gold. What's one thing you feel comfortable buying today for the next 10 years? They might be safe and boring, but you know they're gonna make you a lot of money. Uh, I would love to own Microsoft. I'd love to own Hershey. I'd love to own Coca-Cola. And I'd love to own McDonald's. Oh, one more, Disney. I looked at Disney this weekend, and yeah. I was looking, and I was like, how do I not buy this right here for the next 10 years? They own childhood. Yeah, I see. And I mean, you know, <laughs> exactly. like, my kids love everything Disney. They love to watch Disney movies. They buy Disney toys. Uh, I, I would invest in those names, and I would dividend re just compound. Yep. It's uh, and I I'd be really happy. Yeah, I, I love all those names you just mentioned, and you know you think you know I know Hershey's been a favorite at Stansbury here yeah. for decades now, right? It's yeah. Been like it's it's been a favorite and it's done extremely well. Um, I had a, I had a woman sit next to me. I was in Delray Beach last week as at happy hour. Educated woman, doctor, maybe in her sixties. She said, and I hate this question. You probably get it. What's the one stock I should buy now? Like that's always the worst question in the world. But for years, I always say something like high, you know, very uh, high risk. And I'm looking at her, I'm like, yeah, she's probably conservative. And I said business. And because I'm thinking, my head, and then as I told her, I looked at it the next week, I was like, I gotta buy some Disney. Yeah. Really? Like it's, it's like you said, it owns a childhood. There's just, and, in, and you know, I'm smiling now as bad as 2022 was, Scott. This does create great opportunities. And for you, yes. got, you guys like you and I who love what we do, we love this market. We yeah. look at it and our eyes get big and like, wow, yeah. you don't see this very often. And Correct. if you don't take advantage of it now, you will lag the market. These are the times you have to be a little more aggressive. I'm not saying today or tomorrow, but this time time frame, next six months or so. Yeah, I mean, you, you don't have to you know, leverage the farm right now, no. but I, I certainly think, like I said earlier, be, be doing something, you know, yeah. chipping away. And then when you, th you think that sweet spot opportunity or something really compels you, that's the time to, to jump in and, and go after that stuff. I agree. All right, Scott, thank you so much for joining us. Again, this is Making Money, and this is our uh, Outlook 2023. If this doesn't make you bullish, folks, I don't know what to do. I'm trying my hardest here. Scott came on, and Scott, I will tell you, is not always bullish like me. So I'm glad, I, maybe that's why I waited to have you on for the last eight months. I was waiting until you turned bullish. But again, thank you so much for joining us, Scott. And folks, we got a couple more predictions coming up, shows coming up next week, and we're going to bring on some of my analysts again to talk about that. But as always, have a wonderful weekend. Thank you for supporting us. Have a great day. That's Making Money, and I'm Matt McCall. Opinions expressed on this program are solely those of the contributor and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Stansbury Research, its parent company, or affiliates.